Praise the Lord. Yeah, we just, uh, as we we're getting started, we we're just talking amongst ourselves, those of you who are online, and uh, just so good to be together and um, rehearsing uh, the activities of the cross, the activities of Good Friday, and uh, it really is. And so it's going to be a little bit different tonight. Just want to welcome everyone and. Um, just really good to be together. You know, the Lord, uh, 
he says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. He says, because these times that we gather together, they're important because they draw us together, not just um, so that we can learn things, but they draw us together as the body of Christ and we need each other. You know, we don't always think about that. And in America, we think of ourselves as pretty independent. And, and even those of us who know that we need to depend on each other don't always. You know, I see my friend Dan sitting back there and, and uh, sometimes I forget how important it is for us to spend time together. You know, even if it's just over a fishing pole. You know, that time together. And uh, Jesus cherished those times with his followers too. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, most, mostly we thank you for what happened a couple thousand years ago on a cross. Lord, as we think about those things, we talk about those things tonight, I pray that you would just open our eyes to things we haven't ever seen. Open our ears to things we've never heard. Lord, to give us greater understanding and that uh, what you have done for us, Lord, would just uh, would be buried deep within our hearts, deep within our understanding, not just in our minds, but in our hearts. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. So... Uh, you know, we were talking about, um, uh, I had a lady call me the other day and ask about uh, Christmas, what day Jesus was born. And uh, a lot of the days that we celebrate aren't exactly the days that dates occurred, that uh, events occurred. Um, and even the same with Easter, even though this year, it's interesting, you know, um, Easter, the original time of Jesus' death on the Passover, actually was on a Passover. And Passover and Easter don't always overlap the same way year to year. And this year, they do. And 700 years before Jesus was born, think about that, 700 years. So the United States has been a nation for how long? 1776, so, you know, we're pushing 250 years, right? 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah the prophet came on the scene. And God revealed to him that Messiah would come. Not as a conquering king, not yet. He would come, but not as a conquering king. But he was going to come as a sacrifice for our sin, a substitute for us. And uh, his blood would make us clean. And so what I want to do is I want to read to you first out of Isaiah chapter 53. And this is what Isaiah says. He says, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He's talking about Jesus. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried it was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the, Lord, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. 
unjustly condemned. He was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, that he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for the rebels. You know, Isaiah tells us that what Jesus did was all about us. Well, maybe not all about us, but because of us. Because of us. Sometimes that's hard for me to wrap my head around. But look at this. Jesus said that God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who has faith in him will have eternal life and never really die. That's what it was all about. From the beginning to the end of Scripture, it's always been about this. It's always been about the Lamb. It's always been about the sacrifice. It's always been about the restoration. It's always been about bringing us into right relationship with God. It's always been from the beginning in the Garden of Eden when God sacrificed animals to clothe Adam and Eve, it's always been about the blood that would cover our sins and make us right with him again. It's always been that. So the story of Good Friday, the story of the crucifixion is in all the Gospels. And I'm going to read tonight out of Mark chapter 15. And this is out of the New Living Translation. And so in Mark chapter 15, verse 1, Mark says, Very early in the morning, the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law, the entire high council, met to discuss their next step. You see, that night, very late that night, Jesus had been arrested. We know the story. We talk about it every month for communion. And so it says that then they bound Jesus, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. They had to do that because they wanted to kill Jesus, and Roman law would not allow them to. We've talked about this, how the Jews haven't ruled themselves for a long, long time. And here, even to try someone, to kill someone, they have to go to the Romans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, You have said it. Then the leading priests kept accusing him of many crimes, and Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer them? What about all these charges they are bringing against you? But Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's surprise. Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner, anyone the people requested. One of the prisoners at that time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. Would you like me to release to you this king of the Jews? Pilate asked, for he realized by now that the leading priests had arrested Jesus out of envy. But at this point, the leading priests stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate asked them, Then what should I do with this man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! 
Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. The soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard of the governor's quarters, called the Praetorium, and called out the entire regiment. They dressed him in a purple robe, and they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. Then they saluted him and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him on the head with a reed stick, spit on him, and dropped to their knees in mock worship. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. A passerby named Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. It's interesting that Mark puts this in here. He's the only one that puts that in there. It's almost like he knew Simon because he knows that Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. It's interesting. You, we may hear about them later on in Scripture. And they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. They offered him wine drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes and threw dice to decide who would get each piece. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. A sign announced the charge against him. It read, the king of the Jews. Two revolutionaries, thieves, were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Ha, look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests and teachers of religious law also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross so we can see it and believe him. Even the men who were crucified with Jesus ridiculed him. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. Wait, he said. Let's see whether Elijah comes to take him down. Then Jesus uttered another loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, he exclaimed, This man truly was the Son of God. Some women were there watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. They had been followers of Jesus and had cared for him while he was in Galilee. Many other women who had come with him to Jerusalem were also there. This all happened on Friday, the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. As evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea took a risk and went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Joseph was an honored member of the high council, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus was already dead, so he called the Roman officer and asked if he had died yet. The officer confirmed that Jesus was dead, so Pilate told Joseph he could have the body. Joseph bought a long sheet of linen cloth, then he took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in the cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been carved out of the rock and he rolled a stone in front of the entrance. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where Jesus' body was laid. You know, we've all heard that Jesus died for our sins, and yet sometimes I struggle thinking that Jesus went through all that for my sin, that my sin caused that. 
You know, maybe the aggregate, maybe the whole of our sins together, but Scripture doesn't say that. It was really about our sin. So how about you? Do you ever wonder if your sin really could have caused that? We're going to watch a video together. Which prisoner do you want me to pardon? Barabbas or Jesus, the so-called Christ? What should I do with Jesus? What has he done wrong? They're crucifying him. Barabbas. They're crucifying the man that took your place. I don't mean your place. I'm not saying you should be crucified. cells are next to each other. The crowd is picking up. We need to go. There was a hole in the wall between the cells. I could pull a, a piece out and see him. I saw everything. Barabbas. The Romans may have let you go, but they aren't going to let you live. They beat him. They cursed him. They spit on him. And you never said a thing. You, you never fought back. Once we get out of town and find someone to treat your wound... Did you see what they did to him? It's back. That crown. Those thorns. At least it wasn't you. Why not? Why not me? Why him? I don't know why not. But if we're going to leave, we need to leave now. Stop! Stop talking! Just... took my place. This changes everything. He took my place. He was my substitute. You know, but Barabbas needed a savior, right? He needed a savior. I mean, he was a rebellious person. He was a murderer. He needed a savior. And so we look at this and we go, yeah, that makes sense. I can see where Barabbas needed to have a savior, but needed to have a substitute. But me? You know, Barabbas was going to the cross. But Isaiah said what we just read in Isaiah 53 says that we've all gone astray. We've all gone our own way. Not just Barabbas, we've all gone our own way. We all need a substitute. 
He says that God laid on Him all of our sins. That, our, that all of our sins were laid on Jesus. And that's why He had to go to the cross. There's an old song I'd like us to sing together. Maybe you've heard it. It goes like this. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there? I was going into the city to celebrate the Passover, and he, he was being let out of the city as a Passover lamb. But we didn't, we didn't understand that. Um, when I got to Jerusalem, it wasn't what I expected. I mean, there was like, Ten times more people there than the last time that I'd, I'd been there to celebrate Passover, and it just seemed like the whole city was angry, like just, just mobs of angry people. And there was there was people crying. I saw the Roman soldiers were uh, they were they were shoving people out of the way making room for for this man who um, put a, a, a beam across his neck. He was making his way down the road and people were shouting his name. Jesus. Um I was, I was trying to make sense of it all, the, the shouting, the, the crying, so, so much weeping, um, and all of a sudden this, this, this guard, the soldier, he 
grabs me. He, I mean, he literally just pulls me out of the crowd and he says, for me to carry this guy's cross, if, if this guy's blood get, gets on me, it's, it stains me and I, I, can't, I can't celebrate the Passover. That's the whole reason I was there. And then I saw what all the commotion was about. I saw him. It was a man who had uh, claimed to be the son of God, or at least what was, was left of him. It was hard to see the man through the blood. The, uh, the, the best way that I can describe it is it was like pounds of, of beaten flesh standing there. And then, um, and then our eyes met. This man was not a liar. He was not a, uh, a crazy man with grand ideas. He was, he was the Messiah carrying his cross. I, uh, I sh shouldered I shouldered the cross and I I put my arm around Jesus to help him stand up. His uh, his knees were were buckling under the weight. It, it, it was more than the weight of, of, of a cross beam. It was, he, he, he had the weight of the world on his shoulders. I carried um, what I could, but he, uh, he, carried, he carried most of it. And we... Uh, we, we begin we begin to walk I, I I heard the insults that that they shouted at him and and now at me I felt the spit I felt his his blood on me um, I, I saw the the wounds the scars on his body they'd um, they'd, they'd, they'd taken a, a crown made of thorns and, and then they smashed it on his head and, and, and blood ran into his eyes and the crowd they just kept yelling Where's your God now? Save yourself. Prophesy. They just kept, they just kept, they just kept laughing at him. We got to, we got to Calvary. And, um, they laid him out on a cross and they they nailed his hands and his feet to it and they 
They, they lifted it up. And he, he, had, he had all of his weight on that one spike through his feet. And he would, he would, he would push up with all of his might and, and gasp for a breath to stay alive. I couldn't watch it. He did that for hours. I couldn't watch it. And, and I looked down. And I remember. I remember seeing my hands. My hands were stained with, with his blood. The, the blood that I thought would, would make me unclean. And I realized. It's the blood. It's the blood that, that makes me clean. He, uh, he breathed his last breath and he died. And that was a, uh, that was the day that I helped Jesus carry that was the day that I helped Jesus carry my cross. He hung and died on my cross. You know, in our eyes, a guy like Simon didn't need a cross. You know, he was on his way to Jerusalem to worship God. You know, we would say that he was one of the righteous ones. You know, he hadn't cried out, crucify him. and Yet the cross was for him too. You know, Jesus tells a story of of two men who both owed a large sum of money. One owed a tremendous amount of money and one just owed a large sum of money. And as Jesus is telling this story to uh, one of the religious leaders, he, he says that the man who was owed the money had pity on these two men and forgave them both. And Jesus said to the religious leader he said so which one of these men loved him most and the religious leader said well probably the one who was forgiven the most and Jesus said that's true he said he who is forgiven much loves much and he who's forgiven little loves little you know, I, I've always liked that story. I, I've always had a little bit of, I always wanted to talk to Jesus about that because I really think that those who are forgiven little in our eyes don't really understand how much they've been forgiven. Because we've all been forgiven much. Hands, his feet. So 
Father, thank you for the cross. Father, I pray in the next two days as we recall how Jesus laid in the grave or his body did, the work of redemption that he completed on the cross. Father, help us not forget. Oh, the wonderful cross. Oh, the wonderful cross bids me come and die and find that I may truly live. Oh, the cross oh the wonderful cross bids me come and die and find that I may truly Good night.